Great. Um, so if uh, I'm recording on my computer, so I'm just going to keep going if I lose internet. Uh, we have big storms coming through, so hopefully we will not lose it. Um, I see Lauren's here. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to class. Glad you could make it. I, I'm just having some Wi-Fi problems, so it just works better when my camera's off, if that's okay. Oh. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, I'm just telling folks with the big storms coming through my area, if I lose internet, uh, I'm just going to keep going and record on my end. So I'll put that link up afterwards. So if I disappear, have a good evening and I'll post uh, the link when I can on here. All right. Awesome. Where are you this evening, Lauren? Are you, are you around Orono? Uh, yeah, I'm in Orno. I'm just a little ways off campus. So oh. we have rocky Wi-Fi, <laughs> even <laughs> when it's not bad weather. So yeah. All right. Good. Um, so do any of you have any questions about uh, the week or the course or anything at all I can answer? So sorry. Um, oh, it's fine. Just looking back, like as far as um the like grading process goes for how should we know where we are with that okay um i'm in the process of responding to uh your first piece of writing okay and and that'll give you um sorry i'll, I'll give you a little more sense of grades there um the grading for this course works pretty much like this. You're either getting an A or an incomplete on a piece of work. So I will, I, I'm not entering grades for discussion posts and replies and all that kind of stuff because that's just kind of crazy. I, I will give you a grade for every um, major project that we're doing. So right now, the first is the first piece of writing. The seconds, this next piece of writing. Um, I'll let you know in any grade if it's either an A or it's not there yet. And you might say, hey, you know what? My life is so busy. Tell me where it's at and that's where I'm at. Um, but ideally, when I'm closing grades, they are all A's across the board. So if I haven't contacted you yet and said, hey, you're not working at an A level, you're at an A level, okay? And I know that can be um, a little vague and a little challenging, but for a 400 level course, kind of treat it just like a grad course where the expectation is that you're working at a professional level. And when you're not, or when we disagree on what your professional level is, then we have that conversation. So you'll get a little better sense in my reply to your writing, which will be coming up a little later this week. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Any other questions? Well, th this evening, absolutely jump in with any questions at all. Um, what I wanted to talk about was kind of the bit of the focus of the week, which is this whole idea of why students are writing. And um, the idea that you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, we'll all have those honors and AP students who are going to write just because that's what the assignment is, and they're just going to do that. Um, for other students, it's not that easy. And even for those AP and honor students, um, if they don't have access to choice and variety, then they're really forced into this kind of rigid approach to writing and to putting things together. So I've put together some thoughts. You know, I'll, I'll share some links this evening, um, a couple of my own experiences with students that might give you an idea of some of the possibilities of how to motivate students to write. And even for those students who don't need motivation, how to provide some options for them so that they're able to access a real wide variety of writing experiences. So I'll jump in and um, let me share my screen.
And one of the things that I dislike about sharing screens sometimes in Zoom is that you can't always see um, me presenting, but hopefully you can see me in your side panel. Uh, so, so why write? For some students, um, it's a big challenge. And um, you just give me a show of hands or uh, um, a note in the chat. How many of you have heard of universal design for learning or know what that is? You have, okay. Have you talked about it in education classes, like in writing classes before? Maybe a little bit. Okay, so um, even if it's a slight repeat, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the kind of a way of looking at it. Um, this course and, and your experience as teachers of writing is all about helping young people to write, but there's a lot of ways that they can write and we can, we can help them write. Um, universal design for learning is this idea, let me just move a few things out of the way here. It's this idea that we all need different, um, different opportunities really, different approaches and different ways of doing things. Um, universal design for learning appears all over the place. I was with my students downtown this afternoon and uh, we were just having a conversation on a street corner and the crosswalk signal had changed, but there was a beep and a voice that said, the crosswalk is now available and we could go. Think of the number of times that you go into a store or someplace and you have a lot in your hands, but you can use that button for people with a disability and get the doors to open automatically. Without, dis without universal design for learning, especially in courses involving writing, it can be very easy for students to have an experience that is just purely one kind of writing, one way of learning, and one way of showing what they know. Here's um, kind of the, the official guidelines for universal design for learning. And it means multiple ways of engaging with content, um, providing choices about how people go about things and how they do things. Um, different ways of seeing the information that we're teaching. And for us as writing teachers, you know, sometimes it can be lecture, sometimes it's demonstration, but sometimes it could be things like animation or um, different teachers, um, teachers who are online sharing different experiences with students. Our students are going to find those teachers anyway. You know, they do it right now with um, gaming, right? They always find someone who's better at a certain game to help them get to the next level. Well, they do it the same with learning. They find teachers, um, they find the tricks they need online. We all do it. And our role as educators sometimes is helping curate that and helping them find the best teachers out there. And it also means providing students with opportunities for different ways of showing what they know. Uh, it can be so easy for students to have a, an experience of writing that is just purely essay. That's argument essay, it's literary essay, back to another argument, back to another analysis of a story or a character. And that's pretty much their only experience. In my work teaching with students, you know, I've worked with students who were highly motivated and students who, who really didn't have that uh, that opportunity to, to, to really engage with content in different ways. But for students across the board, the chance to do something very different with writing um, was always welcome. For some, it was the way in, but for others, it, it was just a different opportunity. Maybe some of you have had different experiences in writing. Um, maybe you've had classes that were really heavy with essay, and maybe that was a good thing. Have any of you had experiences in writing in, um, if you think back to high school and even your first years of college, 
that offered you a really different way to write or a different way to show your writing skill? Have any of you had a chance to write poetry? In high, yeah, so in high school? Was it a poetry specific course, Abby? Um, I definitely did it in a creative writing class in high school. Um, I don't know if we ever had an actual poetry specific class, um, but okay. I did take several poetry specific courses in college. Um, so I gotten a lot of experience now that I'm in college, but um, yeah, we had like a whole, a whole unit on writing poetry when I was in high school and actually not just a creative writing class, but um, just a general English class also. That's so, great. That's, yeah. that's really good. That can also be kind of rare. A lot of times uh, it just doesn't, students just don't get that opportunity. So it's offering students variety in, in access to what we're trying to teach them and what they're learning. It's not saying you don't have to learn things, like you don't have to learn argument essays, but there are different ways of learning it. And for us, different ways of teaching it. And definitely providing students with different ways of showing what they've learned does not always have to be the traditional. So this quote from Sophia it was this afternoon at 1.45 as she's leaving my class, my uh, multimedia production class, which counts as an English class for her. And uh, she's an honors student at her school. And she said, just please tell me we don't write essays. And I said, oh, and good essay. That would be a great idea. And she kind of cringed and, and knew I was kind of joking. And I said, well, we're going to do a lot of writing, but a lot of different kinds of writing. Essays very definitely are a thing. And it's, it's writing an essay is a skill that every student needs. You know, we work as educators with the Common Core for state standards, and there are a variety of essay types. They get a bad rap a lot of times. And I think a lot of times they get a bad rap because they follow a pattern, whether it's that hamburger essay from middle school or the five paragraph essay or the literary analysis. They follow this pattern that sometimes for young people don't offer the options to do something different. And for some of you going into education, you may find yourselves entering departments that are run by longtime teachers who have years of experience and very traditional approaches. And it can be a challenge to offer students different ways of engaging with writing. Um, so essays are a thing, but so are all these other things from lists to poetry, literary responses, short stories, summaries, song lyrics, instructions, op-eds, journals. Just um, off the top of your heads, can, can you think of anything that's not there? Other kinds of writing that, uh, that are a thing, that are a skill students need? Well, if you think of any as we go along, jump in and definitely uh, kind of think about them because there's a lot more possibilities, ways that students can show things. So this idea of how we write, there are so many different possibilities for students from individual writing to collaborative writing. Um, that's been the joy of Google Docs of being able to have multiple writers on the same piece bringing different things together. I taught a course last uh, spring um, for grad students who are mostly working educators. And one of the biggest things folks were working on with their students was collaborative writing and was finding ways for students to work together on a piece, bringing different voices, different pieces of research together, different perspectives all in. Prompt-driven writing is a steady thing. And for a lot of our students, it's a really necessary thing. That idea of what do I write about 
um, can just be at a loss. And for a writing instructor, um, being able to see different approaches to a prompt is a huge help, especially in offering feedback on a student by student basis. Research focused writing is a study. Uh, this Common Core standards talk about that. Um, and it's probably one of the real valuable ways students need to engage with writing is being able to figure out what they know and then put voice to that in their writing. And writing that does work, that goes beyond an essay, but writing that actually finds an audience, works at an audience to either inform, change opinion, instruct, or do something like that. In the last live class, I mentioned the education researcher uh, from Britain, James Britain, who um, <clears throat> did a lot of work with young students, uh, mostly elementary, on reading and writing. And he produced most of his work through the late 70s, 80s, into the 90s. And some of his work focused pretty extensively on writing. He came up with kind of three kinds of writing that he saw taking place, especially in schools, but really in life. And I think it works in both ways. I use this pyramid here, um, and I, I think the pyramid analogy kind of works in a sense. So transactional writing is the kind of writing that happens to figure things out. It's often writing that happens in collaboration. It's writing that's trying to understand um, how things work or to inform people. It's that research report. It is the essay that's telling about something like a literary essay. It's this writing that, that does work. It, it does something. It's a report, it's a grant. There's so much of writing that happens that's transactional, where it's a process of the writer figuring things out as they go along, bringing research and multiple voices together and putting it for an audience in the hope that it does something, it makes that transaction. There's expressive writing that's written more for the self, more for the writer. And those are journals and letters and doodling and brainstorms and free writing. It's that writing that it's not really meant for an audience. Um, it might be meant in a school audience for, you know, a teacher or maybe to share in a forum. But it's not especially meant for a wider group. It's the kind of writing where the writer's figuring things out, but more so figuring them out for themselves. I think about this one uh, book students really loved in my classroom. It was um, kind of dating it a little bit. It was Kurt Cobain's journals. And um, they were a mix, you know, they were kind of doodles, song lyrics, all kinds of things like that. And it was probably a really good example, like this kind of a journal of just expressive writing of someone really just writing for themselves, not necessarily expecting to put it out there though maybe something will go out there. And when you think about schools, <clears throat> you know, so much of the writing is transactional. Some of it is expressive, but not quite a lot. And then there's poetic writing. And that's writing like poetry, where the writing is meant definitely not to do work, but it's more writing as art as being able to really work at a piece of writing, to really finally, finally work the words and just find this, this beauty, this creativity and this voice in the words. So kind of that's the long, the long winded way of talking about the different ways that we see writing and the way it works. So um, I guess I skipped ahead of this in the last slide, but transactional, the writing that finds out what we know and think. It's like talking to figure out what we know. Expressive is closer to the self that doesn't go far from the speaker and poetic 
a language for not doing something, but for making something. And I think that's kind of a cool way to look at it. So choice happens in a lot of different ways in a writing classroom, <clears throat> or could happen in a lot of different ways in a writing classroom. Hopefully it does. From offering students loads of choice and topics and style and the approach they take. And while there's certain formula for things like an argument writing, a, a piece of argument writing or um, you know, expository writing, the way that they approach it can happen in so many different ways. Um, the beginning of a piece, you know, we all know, right? Every story has a beginning, middle, and end, but they don't have to be in that order. And sometimes great stories start with the end and you find the beginning somewhere through the middle and you develop it a different way. Writing can happen solo or collaborative um, through exploration that's kind of uncharted or through real good guides and graphic organizers, um, even providing a choice of graphic organizer and teaching students how to use multiple. Especially presenting different ways for students to share their writing, whether it is through audio and maybe as a writing teacher, you never actually look at that piece of paper or that screen of words, but instead you hear the writing in a voice through video, through even things like kinetic type where students animate type on a screen and where you don't quite see things until, uh, until the, the student lets them appear. Let me just show you a piece. I had a student produce a really neat piece. Um, I don't have it handy, but uh, I'll share it at some point. Um, uh, shoot. Um, let's see if I find it just doing this. Okay, here's one. So here's an example. Um, this is uh, Muhammad Ali. It is befitting that I leave the game just like I came in, beating a big bad monster who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. That's when that little Cassius Clay from Louisville, Kentucky came up and stopped Sonny Liston, the man who annihilated Floyd Patterson twice. He was going to kill me. But he hit harder than George. His reach was longer than George. He's a better boxer than George. And I'm better now than I was when you saw that 22-year-old. That's a rather basic uh, one. That's a rather basic one using uh, Muhammad Ali's rumble in the jumble speech. Um, but we can offer students different approaches like that where what they're doing is taking their words and their voice and sharing it in a very different way and we can also see choice in different kinds of experiences that let students connect with other students and that uh, let them have audiences beyond our own classrooms so this is from the educator innovator did you folks find that site? Um, if you had a chance to look at it, was it hard to navigate, easy to navigate? Have you guys looked at it yet? Yeah. Um, and a little yes, a little no, maybe. Um, I put up a uh, kind of a walkthrough video just to give you a little guide on walking through the site because um, it can be a little complex. Anyway, this is a piece I wrote for this uh, page 10 years ago, 11 years ago, so it's a little dated. Um, but it was on how digital writing had just changed the conversation and what, what it meant to write in schools. And I featured a project I was involved in that I helped start. So this goes back a ways. This is in... 2005, um, which is a long time ago, but the idea of uh, even students with computers in classrooms was pretty new. My students had to go to a computer lab. We had the lab like twice a week for an hour 
and that was their access to the internet and computers. Anyway, I worked with a teacher in California and we started a collaborative weblog called Maine to California. <clears throat> I didn't know what a weblog was or how to use this. This was the age of MySpace and um, other stuff like that. And uh, so we worked together to figure it out and we got um, someone on board who could do the setup for the website. Um, and we created this weblog and my students in Maine and his students in San Francisco had access to the blog and they wrote together all the time on this blog. So we had uh, about eight categories in the end, creative writing, hobbies and interests, home and neighborhood. But then we had others that were like politics, issues, um, individuality, all kinds of things. My students were from Winthrop, Maine, really small town, about 300 kids in our high school. These students were about 3,000 in their high school, Galileo Academy of Science. And uh, they kind of wrote and shared different work. Some of the work was definitely expressive. They were journal entries and responses to prompts. Some of the work was um, much more formulated. They were argument essays uh, about issues in Maine, about issues in California. But it did a couple of things. It gave students choice. It gave them an audience. It gave them access to feedback. And we had kind of protocols so, so you wouldn't get trashed if you put something up. And um, it gave them kind of a purpose for writing. Uh, they knew that if they didn't contribute, voices from Maine would go silent. Just like kids in California knew if they didn't contribute, kids in Maine wouldn't know what's going on. Um, so this really gave, it did a lot. It offered collaboration, it offered audience, all that kind of stuff. And it gave a forum for young people to, to write. We had this working for about uh, two years and uh, the teacher out there and I both changed jobs um, and it kind of faded away, but it was a way to really learn about um, how students could write from very different perspectives. And it was pretty fascinating. One of my students, uh, had an aunt in San Francisco and actually went out there and, um, you know, he talked about being in a cafeteria where he was one of the only white kids in there. And uh, so one of my students asked him, like, did, did, they, did they like try to beat you up or something like that? And it was just interesting because that was the stereotype they came into this conversation with that somehow you would be a victim if you were the only white person. So it was this real learning experience on both ends. For students in California, they could not conceive of a high school kid driving around with a rifle in his pickup truck. That was, I mean, that would have gotten them shot or arrested. Um, it just wouldn't happen. So it was just this trade of cultures. Anyway, students had other opportunities um, and you, you can see them if you track this down in education, educator, innovator, to share their writing. So here's a short, just two minute um, piece of a narrative essay uh, by a young man named Josh. And it's uh, about learning to play the guitar. It started when I was a child, growing up listening to my dad sing to me when I was little while playing the guitar. He has been playing for about eight years and continues to excel on what he does, whether when he writes a song or covers a band. As I grew older, I continued to listen to music and it would stick in my head through the day and into the night as I laid down to sleep. When I wasn't outside, keeping myself entertained for countless hours, I would sit in an area and listen to tons and tons of CDs until I had each individual lyric memorized in my mind and I could recite for anyone at any time. When I hit the age of 9 or 10, my dad bought me my first acoustic guitar. I played it for hours and not learned a thing. About two weeks, I decided to leave it alone and quit. I would continue to watch my dad play when he got home from a hard day at work, just sit there, practice until his fingertips would get swollen. About four years later, I picked up a guitar once again and decided to try it once more. My dad decided to teach me the basic chords and how knowing these easy chords can teach you countless songs, and that would be a good start. 
I continued to practice after he taught me those chords. When I got home from school and tried to do my homework, I'd go straight up to my room and grab my guitar and begin to practice till I finally would get something completed. Knowing that I had succeeded to a certain extent would give me a really good feeling in my stomach, and that feeling would give me the confidence to keep trying to what I do. At the end of my eighth grade year, I had thought of trying something new and participate in the school talent show. I got two other kids to play the drums and the bass guitar. After school, I would go in the band room and try to write music that would fit well in the talent show. The first week didn't go too smooth, and we couldn't come up with any reasonable lyrics nor notes that would fit well into the piece. We were about to give up and drop out of the show, but we decided just to cover a band song instead of writing our own. We chose a quick and simple song that we learned in about 10 or 15 minutes and played the song for about 670 people the next day. We may have been off tempo because of nervousness, but after that experience, I overcame it and to perform in front of people and continued to do it after that day. So that's a piece by a 16 year old boy in oh my gosh probably like 2006 or seven and uh done on a computer recorded in a back room but it's not just spoken you know it comes after hours days of revising drafting um rewriting having different people hear his piece and then writing and recording it um and that's the kind of work that uh, that I, I think gives students a, a chance to really see their work in different ways and to to share their work in different ways. And, you know, it's not so often now that. Well, I mean, that it's probably as often that people will read an essay as they will listen to a speaker on a YouTube video. So it's kind of uh, the same approach where the equal value is given to his voice in reading his writing and the writing itself. He didn't have to turn in this and the writing. I, I had seen that for days and days, but this becomes the final piece. Um, so this is kind of worth taking a look at if you get a chance in Educator Innovator. Um, let me just pull back to my slide. So the, the other, op, there's a lot of other options for um, for engaging students in writing, for helping them access audiences, that idea of choice, and for writing that, that does work. I've put a few here, uh, National Novel Writing Month, uh, which is this pretty cool opportunity to engage young people in writing to tell them that month of November, we're going to write a novel, or you are going to write a novel. Um, it's, it's this great opportunity for young people to just tackle writing in a really big way. And for us as teachers of writing, to, you know, help them understand genre, craft, um, getting going, revising, collaboration, all those things that we know make sense and that, that work for writers. So that's one. Fan fiction, um, and many of you may have had um, opportunities or seen different things. I don't know why I'm suddenly having to find trucks here. Um, that's not a truck. Uh, but fan fiction gives young people this really neat chance to, <laughs> sorry, I have to concentrate on trucks for a second. Uh, this really neat chance to um, uh, just to write and to write about things they're really interested in for real audiences who are going to respond to their ideas. And that is a huge factor for young people, right? The idea of writing about something they care about for someone who either they care about or they know or they get a sense may respond to them. Fan fiction takes another step forward when it actually does work and it becomes that transactional writing. Uh, Harry Potter Alliance was something that grew out of fan fiction. It's now become fandom forward. Are any of you familiar with fan fiction? Or are any of you writers of fan fiction? Cool. It's something I had no clue about. 
um, until I started working with young people. And I would just find these students who were writing nonstop. And when I discovered they were like part of the Harry Potter Alliance, um, it's, it's not the kind of writing just for students who, who are just total, um, you know, who would definitely not the type of writing that engages non-academic kids. Um, the young people doing this range from those who are not very excited about school writing to those who are like top of their class and just can't get enough opportunities to write in different ways. Uh, nerd fighters, you may have heard about from the Green Brothers, and nerd fighters um, has kind of moved into some cool things that engage young people. And one of them is their newsletter, which markets things like Ours Poetica, which is... This is a real B&H customer story. Oh Jack gosh. and Barbara, okay. professional wildlife photographers. We'll get through Jack and Barbara and in a second. Hello, my name is Autumn Troy Wild. My name is Jack Underwood. Hi, I'm Mama Holman. I'm Rachel Eliza Griffiths. Hey, I'm Mike Birbiglia. My name is Charlotte Abadzi. I chose this poem because to me... It's just hilarious and romantic all at the same time. It makes me feel like I'm back in the city again. It was also one of the very first poems I ever heard a poet read. And maybe my favorite poem. I should not say you. How lucky. I am. One day I ask her what it symbolizes, she replied, I don't have the words. Why and why and why? Their voices echo in my voice, naming what is lost, what remains. I just get to, um... I will show you. Hi, I'm Sarah Kay, and this is my poem, Forest Fires. I wrote this poem for my grandmother and my dad. Forest Fires. I arrive home from JFK in the rosy hours to find a new five-in-one egg slicer and dicer on our dining room table. This is how my father deals with grief. Three days ago. So I won't um, play a long poem for you, um, but you know the site builds off of um, kind of the uh, philosophy from the Green Brothers, the idea of nerd fighters, that young people of all different walks have something to say. And given opportunity, a forum, um, and an audience can say things that matter in a really big way. Talked a little bit in the week about uh, project-based learning. Let's kind of move this out of the way a bit. Um, and there's some links for you to take a look at when you get into educator, innovator. Project-based learning, as you know, you probably know by now, it's it's uh, ways of approaching education that that that, that does work, that uh, engages students in solving a problem, and doing something collaborative, applying, having an opportunity to learn skills that then they can use in crafting that ultimate project. Project-based learning and writing go hand in glove; they're just so ideal together. I taught in Winthrop uh, for years, as I mentioned, and we had this really, really awful uh, string of student suicides. It was, wound up being uh, five student athletes over the course of three years. And um, in trying to find ways of connecting learning and, and engaging my students in a really positive way to, to do something that would somehow help them cope with this, they discovered that they could create a calendar and have it printed and distributed. And that calendar contained their writing that offered suicide prevention tips, that offered uh, approaches to things that valued their set themselves and what they did and their voices and things like that. And that's the example of, of the kind of work that, you know, works towards a problem. I, 
no one expected a calendar would would solve suicides or teen depression, but it was one step to help students engage with a community issue um, and connect their writing and literacy skills that they could build along the way and do something. Opportunities for journalism. And last week I showed uh, student reporting labs, um, chances to interview. I've worked with teachers who have done these great community interview projects, interviewing veterans um, or helping their students interview veterans and telling their stories and using that as a launching pad for everything from narrative writing to argument writing and different kinds of things like that. Service learning, very much part of the project-based learning. Um, just the idea that the process of learning is doing work to solve or help solve a problem. And things like uh, the Maine Development Disabilities Council and their inclusion awards. It's an annual essay and artwork contest that engage students in like the real simple question of how do we all uh, create a society where everyone is valued. Um, it gives students a chance to work on a serious problem, to use their own voice, and to say something that really matters. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing. I had a student win um, last year with photography and it was just fascinating. It was also fascinating that they didn't see photography as, as artwork. So it was kind of neat to uh, see the student convince the committee that, yeah, photography is artwork. Uh, go figure, I don't know why they didn't see that, but there you go, that's what students can do. And, and finally, the, the last slide I'll, I'll share with you is, um, this idea of uh, creating opportunities for students to use all these things, to use choice, audience, your response as teachers and your feedback and your instruction to do really big things. Um, did I show this last week? Okay, good. So Young Arts, part of the National Foundation for the Advancement of Artists, wicked cool program. Um, here's how it works. Um, it's a contest and students pick a genre or a program. Let's look at the competition. And uh, whether your student is a performing artist, a writer, um, photographer, filmmaker, jazz musician, they have a, a way to apply to become a young artist. I haven't looked at writing so much. I have a student entering writing, but for writers 15 to 18, grades 10 to 12, let's just scope out the application really quick and you'll get a sense. So in this case, submission materials, let's see if we can launch that really quick. Um, Okay, I'm missing what this one is. I think it's a piece, it's definitely a piece of writing. It's kind of a writing portfolio. Oh, here you go. So um, it's writing and it's any of these categories. So could be creative nonfiction, start your application. There's a specific piece of writing that you need to submit and they tell you what that is. My students are entering the photography competition. And so for them, it's five connected images five themes or five from a theme um, and then five individual photos, but then they have to write about that. Some of my students are not uh, confident writers. And so for them, this becomes this big challenge, but it's also kind of works in everything I've talked about tonight because it gives them a way to connect their interests and their passion, which for them is photography with writing for a legit audience, in this case, uh, these national readers of their application for a specific purpose. And that is that they get into young arts and uh, they get, I think they get flown to New York for a week to work with top photographers and then have like a year of mentoring. So for me as a writing teacher, it's an easy sell. Um, we pay their application fee and they get their work in and, uh, try to pull it off. So I appreciate um, 
your uh your attention and sticking around um and kind of like the end for this is that i wanted to show you or share with you kind of uh some of the possibilities for writing but i, I guess a little more on this idea of what happens when teachers of writing can offer choice reason for students to write and an access to an audience um i could have produced another 50 slides and we could be talking about this for ages and you'll find out as you go along that there's just so many possibilities or things students can do so there it is that's the uh class for the week um can i answer any questions or anyone want to jump in with anything it's a little more luxury than i i ever do Well, if you think of any, feel free to, to drop me a line, post it in the questions forum, um, or raise it in any of the forums for the week. And uh, hope you had a few cool things to think about, and uh, I'll catch you in the course. All right? All right. I hope you uh, keep power all night, and have a good one. See you all later. Oh, hey, we had one chat. Oh, that's OK. All right. Have a good one. Oh, okay. Awesome. So, Thank you. Sorry. Bye, Lord.